Hi, this is Frank, and welcome back to The Next Realignment. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the third party system, the system of Republicans and Democrats that emerged out of the American Civil War. Usually when people talk about the third party system, we say it began in 1860 with the election of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and that's because in 1860, in that election, it was the time it became really clear that uh, politics in America was going to now be fought between these parties, between Republicans and Democrats. But in reality, the rise of the third party system was really more of a gradual process because you could just as well date it to 1852 or 1854 with the disintegration of the second party system. And that's because the, at that point, it was already clear that there was the rise of a new grand debate, this debate over slavery. And as early as the uh, 1852 and 1854 elections, we could see that the Jacksonian issues were not only dead, but a new great debate over slavery had replaced it and was now defining American politics. But just as well as that, you could also date it as late as 1865. And that's because even though there wasn't an election in 1865, it was in 1865 that there was a major event, and that was the end of the war itself. Because it was really only until the end of the Civil War that we could really see what the third party system was going to be about. Because the politics during the war was a really strange era, right? One, the country was split in half. So already, one country had become two. And we didn't really have normal political debates. We had debates about a war. And in the North, the Republican Party actually kind of merged. It, it, it came up with a new identity as the Union Party. It was considered a union of the Republican Party and the pro-war Democrats. And it faced off against a Democratic Party that now represented peace Democrats mainly. Peace Democrats being the Democrats or the people in the North who wanted to settle with the South and end the Civil War and just let the Southern states go if that's what they want. Then the Confederacy, they had a no-party system. See, formally in the Confederacy, the idea was that this was a time of national unity and party politics was completely inappropriate. So during the Confederacy, uh, formally there was no parties at all, although you could also say in practice it was a one-party state, that everybody in the Confederacy was effectively a Democrat. So really it wasn't until 1865 with the reunification of the country and the end of the war and the restoration of normal party politics, that the third party system really took its final form. And then we could see that America had once again reunited. It had two parties, Democrats and Republicans, fighting back and forth over politics. These parties were naturally defined, as we've said, over this great debate over slavery. That's what had created them in the first place. But by 1865, of course, wasn't that issue resolved, right? It was resolved on the battlefield through war and slavery had been abolished, but there was still a lot on the table to work through. Like what was that in practice going to mean? Like we knew that the country was going to abolish slavery, but how was it going to be implemented? How was this victory on the battlefield? How was it going to actually be implemented in practice? What changes were necessary to the Constitution? How did the social and economic system of the United States, how did it have to change? And under what terms were the Confederate states going to be allowed to rejoin the Union? And what changes were going to be required in those states and their state governments for them to actually do that? So in other words, you could say the issues of Reconstruction. See, Reconstruction, it's the name that we usually give to the process of readmitting the southern states to the north after the war. That taking a country that had been broken in two and figuring out how to make it one again. And what reforms were going to be necessary to, to both implement the abolition of slavery, but beyond that, deal with the issue of the uh, what was going to be the status of the people who had been rebelled and what was going to happen to the southern states before they could return as states in good standing of the United States. So the issues of Reconstruction now came to define the parties. Formally, the Republicans had now emerged as the party of the Union and the North. And beyond that, 
you could say, of the American establishment. It was the controlling dominant party in the United States, where the Democratic Party was now, at the end of the war, a weak party because it was the party of rebellion and resistance, the party of the South, but beyond that too, the party of anyone who had reason to resent the Republican Party or the American establishment, which in practice mostly meant immigrants, many of them Irish and Catholic in northern cities uh, who had formed political machines to advance their own interest against an establishment that had locked them out of power. And the vehicle that which they could use to do that was, of course, the vehicle of the Democratic Party. Now, at first, at the end of the war, the Republican Party was completely dominant because the Democratic Party, as the party mostly of the Confederacy, uh, had no very little power at all. Not none, but very little power because the Confederacy was under military governors. See, at the end of the war, the southern states had been, they were under military occupation, re- military governors, and the Union had sought to create new state governments and mostly under the Republican Party and the Republican umbrella. So there were new state civilian governments trying to be set up, and they mostly constituted three groups of people. There were the carpetbaggers, who were Northerners who had rushed south after the war seeking economic opportunity. There was this view, it turned out to not be true, but there was the assumption that when the South rejoined the Union and with the abolition of plantation slavery, there would be an economic boom across the South as manufacturing started to flower. So a lot of people from the North rushed south looking to to seize upon this opportunity, and they became part of this new Republican Party. Now, the second group were the group that they called the Scalawags. It was meant as an insult, and it was the Southerners who had Republican sensibilities. And of course, they also came out and, uh, and associated with these new Republican parties. And the last group was the Freedmen. The Freedmen were former enslaved people who had now gained their freedom and entered the political debate and entered politics, and they did it again through the Republican Party. And some of them uh, had even they they ran for office and uh, and w- were elected, joined state legislatures, and some of them were even elected to Congress. Since the Republican Party was so dominant now across the country in the North and where there were governments in the South with a very weak Democratic Party, the debate over Reconstruction at first was an inter-party debate between Republicans. The Republican Party it was split between two groups. There were the sort of the moderates. And then the group they called the radical Republicans, they had a disagreement about how hard and how fast to take Reconstruction with the moderates wanting to, uh, emphasizing kind of uh, bringing the South back in the, into the government through a policy of unity, while the radical Republicans wanted to move harder and faster. They wanted to completely transform the Southern states before they would allow them back. And they wanted, to some extent, to also exact retribution for the betrayal and uh, of leaving the country in the first place, where the moderates were much more concerned about uh, uh, reconciliation than about retribution. And through this, we uh, we saw the civil rights amendments of the Constitution, uh, with uh, abolishing slavery in the Constitution and guaranteeing the due process of law, as well as things like establishing the Freedmen Bureaus across the South, where we uh, federal offices to try to help formerly enslaved people adjust to their new rule, uh, role as free citizens. But slowly, of course, uh, one after another, Southern states uh, kind of had jumped through the hoops and started re-entering the Union. Military governors started going home. And as Southern states gained more control over their local politics, uh, they did so naturally under the Democratic umbrella and not the Republican. And they started destroying and pushing out these local Republican parties, which they saw as tools uh, of the North imposed upon the South. Some of this, of course, was through politics, but some of it also was through intimidation and violence and uh, really uh, uh, campaigns of terrorism by organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. So over time, as this debate over Reconstruction went on, um, the Republican Party weakened nationally and Southern states gained control of their politics. And as they did, they did so under the Democratic umbrella. So we then had a much more balanced system again over time with a Republican Party and a Democratic Party representing both this divide over what to do about Reconstruction, but the interests of the Union and the North versus resistance and the South. And that then takes us to 1876. 
by the 1870s, you saw some major changes in the country. The first was the country was getting really tired. It had now been like two decades that they had been fighting in turmoil and chaos since the implosion of the second party system parties and the chaos that that brought into politics followed by the war and bloodshed and hundreds of thousands dead and then followed by that to the uh, disagreements and the resistance to reconstruction as the union tried to force change in the South and the South resisted and people were really tired and they really wanted to get back to normality and peace and prosperity. At the same time, there was also an economic depression. There was the panic of 1873. So the economy had melted down and people were suffering economically. And then on top of that, you had the election of 1876, a disputed election uh, where it wasn't clear who won. So in the election of 1876, you had a stronger Democratic Party and they had run uh, New York Samuel Tilden. And the Republicans had Rutherford v. Hayes. And this time, the Democrat, Tilden, it's generally agreed he won the majority of the popular vote. It's a very close election, but the Democrat had won the popular vote. But it was a disputed election. There were 20 electoral votes that were marred by accusations of fraud and intimidation that were up for grads, uh, 19 of them from Southern states and one of them from Oregon. And the country had fallen into a constitutional crisis because the presidential election now turned on these 20 electoral votes and it wasn't clear where they should go and how to resolve these accusations of fraud. So the parties decided they had to make a deal. And the deal they made was this. They'd give Hayes the election. They'd give him the 20 votes. And Hayes became president and the Republicans could keep the White House. But in return, they implicitly agreed to end federal supervision of the South and that Reconstruction would finally be over. The troops would come home and the South would finally restore full, uh, their full status as states without federal interference in Southern politics. Reconstruction was declared over even though the job was very much left undone. Now, I didn't say that the third party system, of course, was over. It would continue on for years more, for almost two decades more of campaigns defined by these divisions of the Republican Party that represented the North and the Union and the American establishment in a Democratic Party defined by the South and resistance to Republican rule. There would be campaigns more about rum, Romanism, rebellion, and about waving the bloody shirt. And these civil war resentments would continue to define American politics for campaigns to come. It's just that now in practice, the American political establishment had thrown up their hands. The abandonment of Reconstruction was a national tragedy for America. There was so much left to do that needed to get done and that wasn't. But after this campaign of 1876, the American political establishment said in practice that they were done and this is as far as they would go. So American politics went into years of corruption and drift with nothing its substance except post-war resentments to debate. The country went into political decline, corruption started creeping into the system, and America began the era that we all know as the Gilded Age. Thanks a lot for watching and make sure you tune into the next episode because we're gonna be talking about the Gilded Age, about the era of drift and corruption and ultimately the great populist revolt that tore that system down and set America up for the fourth party system.